Okay, well, good afternoon. Does the mic sound good? Okay. Uh, for Grand Rounds this afternoon, I decided to discuss the treatment of dyslipidemias. Uh, I approached this topic a few years ago at Grand Rounds, and at that time, there was a new class of drug that was still not FDA approved. But since then, we've had about two years of experience with it. Uh, they're highly potent in lowering cholesterol levels, and I think we'll have a major place in management of patients with vascular disease. Uh, in addition, there are other types of drugs, classes of drugs, which are still undergoing testing. And we've gathered new information about some of our older drugs over the past two years. So I think I thought it was worthwhile uh, addressing this topic and giving an update. My conflicts are that I own many equities across different financial sectors. Some are in the pharmaceutical industry, and as I go through the drugs today just by chance, some would be ones that I own stock in those companies. Objectives are first to relatively briefly review lipoprotein metabolism with the idea that if you understand the basics of lipoprotein metabolism, you can more intelligently understand why patients have dyslipidemia and what treatments are most appropriate. I'm going to review the mechanism of action of statins because this then ties into how PCSK9 antibodies lower LDL cholesterol. Mention the class of drug, the cholesterol ester transfer protein inhibitors. These have been tested for many years and provide an update. These are drugs which are highly potent in raising HDL levels. And then some recent evidence that's been gathered over the past couple of years with some of our older friends, niacin and ezetimibe, uh, in regards to their benefits or lack of benefit in reducing cardiovascular disease. So, Begin with a case. A 49-year-old woman with coronary disease, previously with a stent to the LAD, who's presenting with recurrent chest pain, an elevated troponin. She's taken to the cath lab. The stent in the LAD is patent, but there's a new occlusion of the obtuse marginal. And she, this is successfully stented. She has hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and hyperlipidemia. Now, she's been tried on multiple statins over the years, and the only statin she's been able to tolerate in any dose is a maximum of 20 milligrams of pravastatin. And her lipid profile is displayed on the slide. Uh, so what are we going to do for this woman? Uh, the current guidelines say she needs high-dose statin. She's had an ACS. Put her on resuvastatin 40. Cross your fingers double a pravastatin to 40 and see if she could tolerate that statin at that dose, continue her current statin that she's been able to tolerate and add a PCSK9 antibody, stop the pravastatin and replace it with ezetimibe, or continue the same low dose of pravastatin and add niacin. We'll come back to this at the end. So these are the major lipids, cholesterol, triglyceride, Cholesterol certainly being important to maintain the integrity of cell membranes. It's the precursor for the formation of bile salts and steroid hormones. And triglyceride has as its structure a three-carbon glycerol background, backbone, to which are condensed three fatty acids. As we'll discuss, as triglycerides are metabolized, they're converted into monoglycerides and free fatty acids. Now, triglycerides and cholesterol ester are very hydrophobic. So they're poorly soluble in aqueous media, in the plasma. But we know they are incorporated into the structures we call lipoproteins. And the basic structure of a lipoprotein is that in the 
core are the very neutral hydrophobic lipids, cholesterol and ester and triglyceride, surrounded by a shell of more hydrophilic substances like free cholesterol and phospholipid. And inserted into the membrane are the apoproteins, which improve the solubility and also have important functional characteristics. Chylomicrons, those that carry exogenous lipid, are extremely large. Only a portion of one is seen on the slide. Almost exclusively triglyceride, a little bit of cholesterol. The endogenous lipoprotein is VLDL, produced by the hepatocytes, very low density lipoprotein. About four-fifths of the core is triglyceride, one-fifth cholesterol. And important to recognize that inserted into the membrane of a VLDL is one molecule of apoprotein B100. VLDLs, as we'll talk about, lose triglyceride, are converted to IDL. IDL lose further triglyceride, and now you have a cholesterol-rich LDL, still with one molecule of apoprotein B100. Another lipoprotein that is gaining some traction in the literature is lipoprotein small a. It's a specialized form of LDL to which is attached an apoprotein, apoprotein small a. APO small a has regions in it which are homologous with the fibrin binding regions of plasminogen. And because of this, it appears to impair activation of plasminogen and reduce fibrinolysis. And there are some data that higher levels of lipoprotein small a are associated with an increased risk of vascular disease, particularly in those with underlying hypercholesterolemia. And up until recently, the only medication we've had to lower lipopro uh, lipoprotein small a has been niacin. So you're trying to evaluate a patient for hyperlipidemia. Is it a primary genetic disorder? Is it secondary to some other medical condition? And very commonly, it's a combination of both. It's a patient, for example, who might have familial combined hyperlipidemia and diabetes. When you think about the common secondary causes of hyperlipidemia, I've listed them here as well as some medications that we know can affect lipid levels. And it's important to think about these secondary causes. For example, if you have somebody with severe hypothyroidism and hypercholesterolemia, and you place them on levothyroxine in an appropriate dose, their cholesterol might be perfectly fine. Okay? So we need to treat the underlying disorder. And the evaluation of patients for secondary hyperlipidemia doesn't have to be extensive. Take a good medical history. What medications are they on? Get the routine tests that we often get in patients when evaluating them in a primary care clinic. So this slide looks at what we term the exogenous pathway of lipid metabolism. We ingest cholesterol and triglyceride in our diet. These are absorbed, taken up by the epithelial cells in the GI tract, where they're formed into those large lipoproteins, the chylomicrons. Chylomicrons have on their surface one molecule of an apoprotein called B48. The chylomicrons get taken up, released into the lacteals in the GI tract, into the lymphatic system, and ultimately into the systemic circulation through the thoracic duct. As they're circulating in the blood, they acquire other apoproteins, for example, APOE and APOC2. Now, the metabolism of chylomicrons occurs the following way. They bind to receptors on endothelial cells. And this binding requires apoprotein C2. And they bind in areas where there's an enzyme lipoprotein lipase. Lipoprotein lipase takes the triglyceride and breaks it down into monoglycerides and free fatty acids. These then can be transported across the endothelial membrane into adipose tissue, where they're resynthesized back into triglyceride 
and can be used as a form of energy during periods of fasting. So what you can conceive is as the chylomicron is sitting on the endothelial cell being acted upon by lipoprotein lipase, triglyceride is moving from the chylomicrons across the endothelium into adipose tissue, and the chylomicrons are physically becoming smaller in size. They ultimately reach a size that we call chylomicron remnants. These are then taken up by receptors in the liver, and the components are reutilized or excreted in the bile. Now, the endogenous pathway of lipid metabolism begins when hepatocytes produce very low-density lipoprotein, VLDL. And the apoprotein associated here, one molecule of B100. As it's the VLDL circulate, they too acquire other apoproteins like E and C2. And just like chylomicrons, the VLDL bind to receptors on the endothelial cells, get activated by lipoprotein lipase, and the triglyceride is broken down, moves from the VLDL particle into adipose tissue, and the VLDL are physically becoming smaller in size. They ultimately reach a size that we term IDL, intermediate density lipoprotein. These are highly atherogenic, but in normal individuals, very short half-life. Further triglyceride is removed from the IDL, and now you have the cholesterol-rich LDL, still with one molecule of apoprotein B100. Okay. So you can think of LDL as being formed from a VLDL particle from which you've stripped out all the triglyceride. LDL are then taken up by receptors in extrahepatic, but primarily by the liver bind to receptors, and are taken up by, we, we, by what we would consider a non-atherogenic pathway. On the other hand, if LDL levels are particularly high, or if they undergo modification like glycation or oxidation, they're more apt to be taken up by the so-called scavenger pathway on endothelial cells, leading to atheromas and vascular disease. I think we need to pay tribute to these individuals, Michael Brown and Joseph Goldstein, who did their work and still do down I-20 at UT Southwestern. They did the seminal studies that led to the discovery of the LDL receptor, LDL metabolism, and ultimately really to why we use statins. What they taught us is that on the surface of cells are receptors, LDL receptors. They tend to be localized in certain areas we call coated pits. And these receptors bind the apoprotein B100 of the LDL particle. LDL binds to the receptor, gets endocytosed, fuses with lysosomes, the protein component of the apoproteins are broken down into amino acids, and free cholesterol rises within the cell. As the concentration of free cholesterol goes up, three things happen. A decrease in the activity of HMG-CoA reductase, the rate-limiting enzyme of cholesterol synthesis. Activation of an enzyme that stores cholesterol in the cell is cholesterol ester. And reduced expression of LDL receptors on the cell surface. So it's a, it's a nicely integrated system in the sense that as the cell is taking up more cholesterol, it needs less, it produces less, it takes up less. Now an important concept to understand is that LDL receptors can be recycled back to the cell surface. So endocytosis of the receptor with LDL, breakdown of the components, and the receptor recycles back to the surface where it can bind more LDL and remove it by this non-atherogenic pathway. Now, statins work by decreasing HMG-CoA reductase, reducing cholesterol synthesis, but that's not the final pathway of why they're so potent in reducing cholesterol levels. 
what they do is by depleting intracellular cholesterol, it allows for increased recycling, increased expression of LDL receptors on the cell surface, and greater clearance of LDL by this non-atherogenic receptor-mediated pathway, leaving less LDL to be taken up by the scavenger pathway on endothelial cells. I'm only going to mention one fam familial lip, uh, hyperlipidemia today, and that's familial hypercholesterolemia, almost always due to a genetic mutation of the LDL receptor. Okay. There are hundreds that have been described, but they ultimately result in either decreased binding or function of the LDL receptor. Rarely it's due to a mutation of the APA protein B100 gene. The frequency of heterozygotes and homozygotes is listed, as are average cholesterol levels. And we know these patients have a high, very high risk of premature coronary artery disease, atherosclerotic disease, and typically tendon xanthomas. The homozygotes, not the heterozygotes, can also get tuberous xanthomas, which are large collections of fat, typically over the elbows and the knees. So this is a typical example of tendon xanthomas. They tend to occur earliest in the Achilles tendon, where they can form nodules, or even earlier you may feel some thickening. And the reason I show this, this is a favorite board question, step question, board question, if they show you someone with tendon xanthomas, it's familial hypercholesterolemia. So 2003, there is a family discovered in France that has the familial hypercholesterolemia phenotype, but no identifiable mutation of the LDL receptor or apoprotein B100. They have premature atherosclerosis, they have tendon xanthomas, but none of the identified mutations. What is discovered is they have a gain-of-function mutation of a serine protease known as proprotein convertase subtilisin kexin type 9. It's a mouthful, PCSK9. If you overexpress the gene for PCSK9 in a mouse, they have reduced LDL receptor function and higher cholesterol levels. Knock out the gene, and you get increased receptor function and lower LDL cholesterol levels. A few years later, Cohn and his colleagues report in the New England Journal a longitudinal epidemiologic study. And this is their data. They looked at 9,000, well, about over 9,500 in white individuals of which 9,223 had no mutation of PCSK9, but 301 had a loss of function mutation, resulting in a 15% reduction in LDL cholesterol, but a 47% reduction in coronary heart disease. In the African American population they studied, there were 3,278 with no mutation, 85 with one of two mutations, resulting in a 28% lower LDL cholesterol level and an 88% reduction in coronary heart disease. So I've showed you this slide before, and I show it again to emphasize the importance of the LDL receptor recycling back to the cell surface to clear more LDL cholesterol. What PCSK9 is, it's a product of hepatocytes. It gets produced by hepatocytes. It gets into the extracellular environment. It binds to the LDL receptor. Now when LDL binds to the receptor and gets internalized, the receptor, rather than being able to recycle back to the membrane, gets degraded. Now, statins, as I've try to emphasize previously, work by depleting intracellular cholesterol and increasing the recycling and expression of LDL receptors on the cell surface. But statins also increase the activity of PCSK9. And the higher PCSK9 activity leads to some degradation of the LDL receptor and limits the effectiveness of statins. Just think how much more potent they would be 
if they didn't raise PCSK9 levels. So how has, can this knowledge be leveraged possibly to the benefit of treating patients? Well, the way that has been developed thus far is the pharmaceutical industry has produced monoclonal antibodies to PCSK9. These are injected subcutaneously and bind to the PCS, uh, to the uh, PCSK9, limiting its ability to then bind to the LDL receptor and allowing for increased expression of receptors on the cell and improved clearance of cholesterol by receptor mechanisms. There are two that are available in this country, evolocumab and alaricumab. This is a monotherapy study with evolocumab given in dose of 140 milligrams subcutaneously every two weeks or 420 milligrams monthly. Subcutaneous injections compared to either placebo or azetamide. What you can see with the PCSK9 inhibitor is a rapid decrease in LDL cholesterol that persists as long as the drug is administered and the typical decrease is 50 to 60 percent. This is alaricumab, a monotherapy study, compared again to azetamide, starting LDL level of 140 after treatment with this PCSK9 antibody in a dose of 75 milligrams subcutaneously every two weeks or up titrated if there was not an adequate response up to 150 milligrams every two weeks. A reduction from 140 down to about 60, 57 percent reduction in LDL cholesterol. Now most patients who are currently being treated and most patients in the clinical trials, it's been addition of PCSK9 antibody on top of background statin therapy in individuals who are not achieving an adequate lowering on statin therapy alone. So this is evolocumab given in various doses, but in the clinically relevant doses, again, you can see whether injected every two weeks or every four weeks, 50 to 60 percent reduction in LDL cholesterol. And the reduction occurs whether it's monotherapy, whether it's combined with higher low-dose statin or even on top of combination therapy with statin and azetamide. Typically, you can get bored, 50 to 60 percent reduction of LDL. I like this slide because it gives us some fair and balanced discussion. This is a slide I found which compared the two currently available drugs marketed in the United States, evolocumab, alaricumab, showing equal efficacy. And also, and not shown on the slide, uh, the spectrum of potential side effects is quite similar and, and really quite low. One other efficacy study, these were patients who were on rosuvastatin, either 10 or 20 milligrams daily, who were not felt to have achieved an adequate lowering of LDL by the investigators. They were randomized to three groups, double the rosuvastatin, continue the same dose of rosuvastatin and add azetamide, the gray bards, or continue the same dose of rosuvastatin and add alaricumab, the orange bars, and you can see again the greater decrease in LDL and a greater percent of individuals who achieved what was considered by these investigators to be a desirable LDL. If we look at other lipoproteins and apoproteins in response to these PCSK9 inhibitors, typically a 40-45% reduction in apoprotein B. Modest decrease in triglyceride, modest increases in APOA and HDL. What was a bit unexpected, 30-35% reduction in lipoprotein small a. And as I mentioned earlier, the, up to this point, the only other drug known to reduce uh, LP small a was niacin. Now, who's going to benefit from these drugs? 
those at high risk for cardiovascular events who are not achieving an adequate lowering of their cholesterol on statin-based therapy, or those who are having side effects from statin. Now granted, the true myositis with muscle destruction and high CPK is quite uncommon with statins. It can occur, but it's quite uncommon. But more commonly, those patients who complain of the myalgias, despite being tried on multiple different statins. So here's a study in which patients who reported myalgias and statin intolerance were randomized to azetamibe or evolocumab. And the point of this study was there was no increase in complaints of myalgia on those on the PCSK9 antibody compared to azetamibe, no increased muscular complaints, weakness, elevations of CPK, or abnormal liver enzymes. This is another study, and I show it. It was just published uh, very recently this year another study in statin intolerant patients. And this one was designed a little bit better. What they did is they took patients who reported statin intolerance. And in the first phase of the study, they re-challenged them with statin or placebo and confirmed which subjects actually truly had statin intolerance. Those who were statin intolerant were then randomized to azetamibe or evolocumab, again, the decrease in LDL with evolocumab. And in this case, muscle-related adverse events were no more frequent with the inhibitor as with zetamibe. Now, all of this is well and good, but all I've showed you so far are surrogate endpoints, changes in lipids. What's going to happen to vascular disease? That's the real endpoint we want to identify. So this is a study in which individuals, I believe it was about 570, were undergoing coronary angiography with IVUS, intravascular ultrasound, that can quantify and examine atherosclerotic plaque within the coronary vessels. These patients were not on PCSK9 antibodies, but they were divided into quintiles based on their endogenous PCSK9 level. The data showed that those with higher levels of PCSK9 did not have greater amount of plaque, but a greater percent of that plaque had a necrotic core, which made them a more suspect lesion for getting an occlusion and causing an acute coronary event. This is an animal study. This is mice who have been genetically engineered to develop severe hyperlipidemia and atherosclerosis. This is, these are aortic slices. This is, these are the control animals, and you can see the atherosclerotic plaque in panel A. Treat with atorvastatin, still some plaque, but considerably less than the control. Treat with a low dose of alaricumab, again, a little plaque, less than atorvastatin, certainly less than control. But if you used alaricumab in a higher dose, if you used it in a higher low dose with atorvastatin, virtually no plaque was identified in this animal model. What about humans? There is precious little data to report. What I'm going to show you is all that I can find out in the literature. These are two articles that were published back to back in the New England Journal last year. About a month ago, I called the scientific liaisons for Sanofi and for Amgen, companies that market these drugs. What they could tell me is what I already knew. There are ongoing large-scale trials looking at hard cardiovascular endpoints with tens of thousands of individuals, but no data to share yet. Okay. So this is all that's out there that I can find. So this is Evolocumab, again, most of these were patients who were on a variety of different background standard therapies. Some were on statins, some were not, some were statin intolerant. And if you look at the group who also were treated with standard therapy, but Evolocumab on top of this, over the course of one year, there was a 53% reduction in coronary events 
vas major vascular events, uh, which included death, MI, unstable angina, revat that required vascularization, stroke, TIA, heart failure, requiring hospitalization. Now, the number of events are very small. The time interval is very short. This is the data. The other article in that New England Journal issue was with alaricumab. Almost all these patients in this study were on background statin therapy. And the group that had alaricumab, again, that boring 50 to 60 percent reduction in LDL cholesterol. And in this case, up to 78 weeks, there was a 48 percent reduction in major coronary and vascular events. And again, number of events was very small. So I want to summarize what I can about these antibodies. They're fully humanized, so it minimizes immune reactions. No obvious signal for liver or muscle toxicity. Occasionally some injection site reactions. They are quite costly, $14,000, $12,000 a year. Okay? So I think you need to carefully consider this if you're going to prescribe it for an individual patient, can they afford it? Is their insurance going to cover it? What's their copay going to be? Okay. And are you willing to fill out all the paperwork for drugs that are this expensive? And I think as healthcare professionals, we have to say what's best for the health of the country. These are very expensive drugs. If everyone gets put on them, it's going to significantly increase healthcare costs. And we need to carefully select those patients who will benefit and those patients who might do just as well on other types of therapy that will be less expensive. Lastly, the outcomes data thus far are largely surrogate endpoints. Hard data endpoints are very limited, but there are the large scale ongoing trials where we expect results in the next year or two. Now, personally, I'll give you, I'll editorialize, I think these drugs are going to be highly potent in reducing vascular events for two reasons. One is the short-term data on outcomes is encouraging. More importantly to me, these drugs reduce LDL cholesterol by the same mechanism that statins do, by increased clearance through the LDL receptor, that non-atherogenic pathway, and we recognize how potent the statins are in reducing vascular disease. Now, moving on to the cholesterol ester transfer protein inhibitors. What this enzyme is, this is an enzyme that moves cholesterol from HDL into VLDL and LDL. So if you de decrease the activity, you're going to raise HDL and you're going to reduce LDL and VLDL. And in humans that seem to have a deficiency of this enzyme, they seem to have high HDL levels and a lower risk of vascular disease. And if you block the enzyme activity in experimental animals, they tend to have less atherosclerosis. So what a wonderful target for the pharmaceutical industry. And I can tell you hundreds of millions of dollars, probably over a billion, has been invested in this class of drug. The first drug to be investigated within this class to any major degree was torcetrapib. Torcetrapib was given to over 15, well, 15,000 individuals were enrolled with high risk of heart disease, were enrolled in a major trial, randomized to torcetrapib plus atorvastatin versus atorvastatin low and high dose. At one year, HDL goes up 72 percent. Nothing before this would raise HDL this much. LDL goes down 25 percent, and the studies terminated early. Why? Because the Data Safety Monitoring Board found an increased risk of death and heart disease in the individuals exposed to torcetrapib. Okay. Well, this drug did have a modest effect on raising blood pressure, and it increased aldosterone levels. So people speculated, well, maybe that's the problem. So there are other drugs within this class that have been and are being tested. Anisetropib, ibisetropib, dalsetropib. None of these other three have been shown to raise the blood pressure or increase aldosterone levels. What do we know? 
2012 dalcetropib trial terminated early, not because of harm like torcetropib, but lack of efficacy. Last year, evacetropib, Study terminated early, not superior to placebo, in reducing cardiovascular outcomes in patients who are at high risk of vascular disease, despite, despite a 130% increase in HDL and a 37% decrease in LDL. Anisetropib, I think, is still being tested. Results are expected next, next year. No great enthusiasm that any drugs in this class will ever prove to be beneficial. What does it teach us? It emphasizes the importance of not relying on surrogate endpoints. You just can't look at lipid levels and say this is a good drug. If you're using a drug to reduce vascular disease, you've got to show it reduces vascular disease. What about niacin? So niacin's been around a long time. Very limited data whether it actually reduces cardiovascular events. So I don't know the company that makes, um, um, what's the drug? Extended release niacin. Um, well, there are several of them. But one of the companies that makes the more commonly prescribed form of this decides they're going to show it's beneficial and gain more share of the lipid market. So the AIM High study is designed in patients who are intensive lipid lowering therapy, typically with statin, at high risk for vascular events and randomized to placebo or extended release niacin at fairly respectable doses of 1,500 to 2,000 milligrams a day. They select patients at high risk of heart disease with low HDLs modest increases in triglyceride, 150 to 400. And the study is done this way. Many of these patients were on lipid-lowering therapy initially, and it stopped, and they had a run-in period, and then randomized to simvastatin, 40 to 80 milligrams daily in both arms with either placebo or extended-release niacin. During the course of this study, the data emerged that 80 milligrams of simvastatin was associated with an increased risk of adverse events. And so some patients in this study on 80 milligrams were back titrated to 40 milligrams. Some, if they were tolerating the 80 milligrams well, were continued on it. Niacin did what we expected to do. Niacin does everything good to lipids that we would like to see. That's the dotted red line. It raised HDL. It lowered LDL. It lowered triglycerides. So, changes. Unfortunately, no reduction in vascular events, whether you looked at combinations of multiple vascular events or individual ones. Maybe the study wasn't designed so well. So, the, here we have a study published last or two years ago in the New England Journal in which patients at high risk for heart disease on top of statin therapy and other therapies to treat dyslipidemia were randomized again to placebo or extended release niacin. This time combined, it was a combination pill. It had a prostaglandin inhibitor to reduce the flushing side effects of niacin. No reduction in vascular events, but increased risk of diabetic complications, new onset of diabetes, GI symptoms, infection. More complications, no benefit, and as I think maybe you've observed over the last couple of years, much less use of niacin in these past few years than has been used previously. Uh, how about our old friend azetamibe? Okay. This is a medication that blocks an enzyme important in the absorption of cholesterol in the brush border of the GI tract. It reduces cholesterol absorption. It was approved 13 years ago, and it typically lowers LDL about 
Prior to last year, there was very limited data to confirm or refute whether azetamibe actually reduced cardiovascular events. The IMPROVE-IT trial was published last year in the New England Journal. And the design of this study was as follows. They took individuals who had a recent ACS, provided them with standard medical and interventional therapy, randomized them then to simvastatin 40 milligram or combination simvastatin 40, 10 milligram of azetamide, minimum follow-up two and a half years, and the primary endpoint was a typical composite of cardiovascular endpoints. Cardiovascular death, MI, admission for unstable angina, revascularization, or stroke. LDL levels between the two groups, simvastatin monotherapy, 69.5, combination therapy with azetamide, 53.7. In this case, there was a statistically significant reduction in vascular events. Okay. Now, here's the slide from the New England Journal. It is statistically significant, but the magnitude is somewhat modest. It's only a 2% reduction in vascular events. But it was a positive trial. So other things that we might be hearing about in future years, there are other antibodies to PCSK9 that are being tested in development. How about reducing PCSK9 activity by other means, like using small interfering uh, RNAs that target the RNA for PCSK9 or small molecular weight inhibitors of PCSK9? What if you can drop and decrease VLDL synthesis, remembering that VLDL are metabolized to LDL? There's an enzyme microsomal transfer protein involved in the synthesis of VLDL. There is an inhibitor of this enzyme known as lamidipide. There is an antisense oligonucleotide to ApoB, so you don't make ApoB proteins. And both of these can significantly reduce VLDL, cholesterol, and LDL. I'll tell you, both of these drugs are in fact FDA approved, but they are only approved to treat patients with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. They're only approved in a very restricted program. The physician needs to be trained how to use them, and the pharmacist has to be trained in how to use them. The reason is these drugs have a high risk of resulting in abnormal liver enzymes and fatty liver. Okay. Now, why are they approved for homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia? Because these patients have cholesterol levels of 700, 1,000, 1,100, and they typically die in their 20s and 30s, and we have no medical treatment that really works. They have no functioning LDL receptors. The only way that we really have to treat them other than these drugs is to physically remove LDL by, for example, plasmapheresis every few weeks or passing their plasma every few weeks over a column that will bind and remove LDL. So these drugs are approved, but in a very restricted manner for a very select, rare group of individuals. Other things that might block enzymes early in the synthesis of lipids, uh, there's been some investigation of modified thyroid hormone molecules to try and find one that will lower cholesterol but not increase the heart rate. That doesn't seem to be going very far uh, at this point. And there are lots of other things out there that are being tested. This, this uh, table is certainly not inclusive. So let's come back to our 49-year-old woman who recently had an ACS who can't tolerate statins except for 20 milligrams of pravastatin. What are we going to do? Well, you can decide what you want to do. I'm quite sure she won't tolerate 40 milligrams of rosuvastatin been tried and failed. You could try increasing the pravastatin, but this is low-dose statin therapy. This is not what this patient needs with a recent ACS. You could, you're, 
Ezetimibe is monotherapy, no data. I think I've tried to debunk the effects of using extended release niacin. And this is a person, I would add PCSK9 antibody. Now, that's not in the guidelines now. Okay? There is no information and recommendations at this point in, for example, the American College of Cardiology guidelines about using PCSK9 antibodies. But I think as the data emerges in the next few years on outcomes of patients, I think we will see this incorporated into the guidelines. So, in conclusion, I hope I've tried to convince you that if you can learn a little bit about lipoprotein metabolism, you will be smarter at figuring out why a patient has a problem and how to treat them. That the PCSK9 antibodies are quite potent in reducing LDL cholesterol and ApoB levels. They're well tolerated with limited toxicity, limited signals for muscle or liver toxicity. Outcomes data is at this point weak, but there are large on, uh, ongoing uh, trials. We hope to get data from these in the next year or two. The CETP inhibitors, they markedly increase HDL. They moderately decrease LDL. They do not reduce heart disease, again emphasizing the importance of relying on hard data endpoints if you're looking for something to reduce vascular disease, not surrogate endpoints. Uh, niacin, no benefit in the available clinical trials. And azetamibe, some benefit when combined with statin to a modest degree. So, yes, John. Okay, you could do that. I actually had that and I changed the, the answer. Um, you could do that. Again, this is a patient with ACS where she really needs high dose statin therapy that she cannot tolerate. And so your suggestion is, is reasonable, um, but I think in the face of her risk of future events, I would choose something that's at least not in the guidelines now, but I think would be more likely to be successful. Sean. PCSP9 antibodies uh, is effective in somebody that's had plaque for a long time, maybe somebody that's in their 70s versus somebody in their 50s, as far as like reducing it, or is it just that it uh, prevents new plaque buildup? And the same for, for statins. Okay, is it, great. Is it so yeah. hard that it just can't be removed very easily? Great question. I've not seen any plaque regression studies like we've seen in some of the statins. Uh, those are usually done with IBIS you know, with intravascular ultrasound. I'm not aware of any. Is anyone else, Sanders, you? I'm not aware of any, any plaque reduction studies that are currently available. I'm quite sure if I got on this computer and, and went to uh, clinicaltrials.gov, we would find some studies ongoing. Yes, Is there any role for fish oil in the treatment of hyperlipidemia now? Uh, it's, I, I believe so. As far as, again, as far as I know, I think there are, there are some, some studies that are ongoing that I have not seen any outcomes data, but there are, there are some. Are you, very, or Harsha, there are some studies, aren't there, with fish oil? Yeah, right. So these, the, the fish oil products mainly are virtually are exclusive in reducing triglyceride. My experience with them have been when I've used over-the-counter fish oil, Number one, there are dozens, hundreds of products out there. They have different amounts of fish oil, omega-3s, omega-6s, and it's hard to know what patients are really getting. When I've used the prescription forms of fish oil, there are now, I guess, three prescription forms of fish oil available. They're relatively expensive. I think about $200 a month. Uh, I've, been, I've had good success with those. So I think they have a role in patients that have hypertriglyceridemia. Um, my concern is, and I just saw a patient yesterday, or the day before, who has bad hypercholesterolemia, and she's had heart trouble, and she has statin intolerance, and her primary care physician 
put her on one of these prescription fish oil products, and I don't know whether I don't, she didn't really have any major triglyceride problem, and I happened to get an LDL on her, and it was 198. You know, her triglycerides were okay, but her LDL was 198, and she needs something considerably more than fish oil. But for the right patient, and for patients who are at risk of pancreatitis and eruptive xanthomas and severe hypertriglyceridemia, I think it has a place. Okay, thank you.